I'm Natasha Kierczek, and thanks for joining us from our studios in Israel. Coming up in today's newscast, the manhunt for the killer of Rabbi Gazael Shevach ends in bloodshed. Germany recognizes Algerian Jews as Holocaust survivors for the first time. And we'll reveal how a unique therapy is helping Israeli patients literally kick cancer's butt. Stay tuned for the latest news in Israel. Israeli security forces have finally ended a month-long manhunt for the suspected killer of Rabbi Raziel Shevach. A Palestinian terrorist killed the rabbi last month in a bloody drive-by shooting. And now police have just announced that the suspected killer has been shot and killed by Israeli troops. Israeli National Police, Border Police and Counterterrorism, the Amam, carried out an operation overnight to focus and try and find the terrorist who carried out the deadly attack that murdered Rabbi Shevach just over three weeks ago. As a result of the operation, the terrorist was shot and killed. There were no injuries to our officers. And counterterrorism operations will continue in all areas in order to prevent and respond to any terrorist attacks in the different areas of Israel. Shin Bet and IDF forces work together in a long and deeply coordinated effort to track the suspect, 22-year-old Ahmad Nasser Jarar. He was found in the Palestinian village of Yamun in the West Bank. When security teams surrounded his building to arrest him, Jarar allegedly exited the building with an M16 rifle and a bag of explosives, prompting troops to open fire. The murder of Rabbi Raziel Shevach, a father of six, also prompted cabinet leaders to legalize the formerly illegal Chavat Gilad outpost in the West Bank earlier this week. Prime Minister Netanyahu has hailed the army's successful operation to track down this terrorist. But the rabbi's widow, however, has shared a somewhat different view. After learning that her husband's killer had been killed, she told Army Radio that, quote, I understand the desire for account settling, but when it comes with another killing, we haven't solved the problem. Meanwhile, Israeli security forces are conducting a full-scale manhunt for the suspect in yesterday's terror attack outside of the Jewish community of Ariel in the West Bank. Rabbi Itamar Ben Gal, a father of four, was killed in the tragic stabbing. Police believe the suspect is a 19-year-old Israeli Arab who spent time living in Jaffa named Abed Al-Karim Abdel Asi. ILTV's Aaron Porras is here with more. So Aaron, this is a very, very upsetting uh, story for many reasons here in Israel. Oh yeah, I mean, Israelis basically everywhere are very conflicted when they hear stories like this because while Israel tries to be a very pluralistic and accepting society with lots of different religions and respect for each other, um, to realize that an Israeli citizen is not only capable but went through with it, you know, such an attack of hatred and terrorism is, is very jarring. Um, you know, especially when you see an Israeli Arab, again, do this kind of violence and then there are videos uh, of uh, Palestinians actually supporting him, uh, and that's even more kind of uh, alarming to a lot of Israelis because it's it, well, it makes fear them, that other, right, it makes them fear that other people Arabs might would... might uh, get inspired to follow his suit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, what about the information that is showing that Asi was also the recipient of Israeli aid? Uh, that's true, actually. The reports show that he was in and out of foster care, not, not foster care, but social services uh, here in Israel, and he was receiving uh, uh, services even from at-risk youth services here in Jaffa, uh, and that he was abandoned by his family, you know, at an earlier age. Uh, but actually that at-risk youth center even asked him to leave eventually because he was still, despite having been abandoned, was continuing to visit his family members in Nablus and things like that. Um, yeah. All right, well, let's, let's turn to your report. The rabbi was stabbed in the chest yesterday and succumbed to his wounds. Graphic video footage captured the suspect getting out of a taxi van, crossing the street, and then stabbing the unsuspecting rabbi as he was waiting for a bus. Unfortunately, this is in line with many such terror attacks in the West Bank, but for the suspect to have Israeli citizenship certainly changes the profile. Israeli troops have conducted raids throughout villages surrounding the Jewish Ariel settlement, and Prime Minister Netanyahu has vowed the suspect's swift capture, just like last evening's neutralization of the murderer of Rabbi Raziel Shevach. Hamas has hailed this attack as evidence of the ongoing intifada of resistance against Trump's controversial Jerusalem decision. Police have not yet released much info about the suspect other than that his mother lived in Haifa until recently and that his father is a Palestinian man from Nablus in the West Bank. 
Though more than half of Israelis support the government's controversial plan to either deport or indefinitely jail nearly 40,000 African men, women and children in the country, outrage against the idea continues to surge. Some of the world's top legal experts, including Israeli lawyers, say the idea is a total violation of human rights and illegal under international law. Their plea to Israel's attorney general argues that forcing African asylum seekers to choose between jail or deportation to a third unnamed African country is illegal and that it's clearly, quote, aimed at breaking the detainee's spirit. The government, however, says the plan only applies to illegal migrants here for work. <laughs> Experts point out, however, that the vast majority of those who just received deportation notices are primarily Christians from Eritrea and Sudan, countries that have almost unanimously been accepted as refugees by the rest of the world. As of today, Israel has only granted refugee status to 11 such asylum seekers out of nearly 40,000. I will choose, it's not a choice, but I will force her to be in prison if they decide, because at least I will be stay alive in the prison. Many Israelis blame this community for spiking crime in South Tel Aviv, where most live. But police say African asylum seekers account for only 40 percent of all crime in the area, despite making up 70 percent of the population there. Israeli groups in South Tel Aviv, like Asaf, have been providing humanitarian services to African asylum seekers for years. They say most come to them with stories of horrific torture, rape, and worse. These are people arriving from Eritrea and from Sudan, two countries that are known to, um, to be uh, committing human rights violations, uh, committing torture. Um, these people deserve international protection. Uh, they deserve international protection in Israel as well. This is why some Israelis are preparing to physically hide African asylum seekers in their home before the deportations begin, an idea first started by dozens of Holocaust survivors here in Israel gearing up to do the same. They think that us, you know, as Israelis as, and as uh, Jews, we are, we're obligated. We got some kind of, a, I don't know, a moral compass, you, can, you may say, or something that, that uh, we just have to do it. I don't know, I just feel uh, like a strong urge to do it. Poland has just canceled a meeting with the Israeli education minister Naftali Bennett in response to a statement he just released to the Israeli public. Bennett was planning to meet Polish officials to discuss Poland's recent decision to pass a law that makes it illegal for people to refer to Nazi concentration camps like Auschwitz in Poland as Polish concentration camps. And his message was already very clear, saying, quote, the past cannot be rewritten. The Polish people had a proven role in the murder of Jews during the Holocaust. Joining us now with more details is Knesset member Musi Raz. Thank you for joining us. Now, what do you think Poland is so afraid of hearing? I think like many nations, they are afraid to hear uh, the old truth what was in the war. They are afraid to hear uh, not only the truth, they are afraid to hear lies too. Uh, for example, to what I mean, lie. Uh, they are right that they were no uh, Polish con concentration camps. But on the other hand, they are afraid a little bit to hear the truth that part of the Polish people, not all of them, a minority, cooperated with the Nazis and helped to uh, murder Jews. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I do remember that on the other hand, uh, many Polish uh, people may, uh, were fighting against the Nazis. I do remember that uh, several thousand uh, Polish uh, 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 men and women actually uh, had to rescue and to secure Jews. Uh, and I do remember that the Polish people was a victim too, and many of them were killed by the Nazis. Right. Well, the but point the is just to the day, yeah. The the point is to remember essentially uh, the wrongdoing that took place as well. We can't forget this. But do you? I mean, what was Bennett's plan during this meeting? Was what was the the game plan in terms of getting Poland to change this law, if at all possible? Should he have kept that statement to himself until uh, his actual visit? I, I'm not sure that I know what was his plan. Somebody, sometimes he thinks that he can change the whole history and to change the whole thinking of the people by just uh, talking to them. Uh, 
So I don't really know what was his plan, but uh, uh, actually he said the truth. As many people, he said part of the truth. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Polish uh, establishment did not like uh, this part of the truth. Yeah, what, they, what effect do you like, think the cancellation... They like other part of the truth. Well, well, my question for you is what you know effect do you think that this cancellation is going to have on future relations between Israel and Poland? Yes, I, I think that this is, uh, yes, yes, I think that there is, uh, this is a problem to the relations between Israel and Poland because uh, a person like me, and I'm not a supporter of Minister Bennett, when I hear about things like that, I am in his side and not in the Polish side. I think that uh, accepting, uh, adapting uh, mm -hmm. this legislation, uh, the Polish uh, establishment, uh, actually made a very long uh, step uh, towards uh, uh, Holocaust denial. I'm yeah. not saying that they, that they denied the Holocaust, but this is a step towards uh, Holocaust uh, denying. And I think this is a, a very big uh, mistake. And uh, I, I do think that Israel should think about our future relations with a state that is adopting such a legislation. Right. Maybe we should uh, call back the ambassador in order to think about uh, the future of our relations. All right. Well, thank you for joining us, and I guess we're just going to have to wait and see what happens. Yeah, thank you. In a shocking first, Germany has just officially announced that it will recognize nearly 25,000 Jewish Holocaust survivors originally from Algeria. Many are still alive and uh, living all over the world, including almost 4,000 that are based right here in Tel Aviv. Algerian Jews experienced abject anti-Semitism under France's Vichy government during World War II. This discrimination became law in 1940 when thousands had their French citizenship revoked, the beginning of the end for many Algerian Jews. Seventy years later, the German government has decided to begin righting this wrong, announcing a one-time compensation of a little over 2,500 euros to survivors. That's roughly $3,157. Regardless of the money, many see this recognition itself as, quite frankly, long overdue. The compensation agreement took years of negotiations between Germany and representatives of the survivors. Getting access to a credit card when you're a new immigrant in the United States isn't very simple. Banks require a credit history within the country that new residents just don't have. Well, joining us now in the studio is Elno Rosenroth, the CEO and co-founder of Credit Stacks, a company that has a solution to this very issue. Thank you so much for coming in. Thanks a lot for having me, Natasha. All right, so what is the service that you provide? Essentially, we help uh, high-quality immigrants, uh, professionals that relocate to the U.S., uh, get access to a credit card on the day they land in the country, which is revolutionary because up to now, uh, it took several months and quite a lot of pain in order to be able to get the first quality credit card. Absolutely. Cards. So, how, I mean, how did you come up with this idea? Is this <laughs> personal experience of, of sorts? Definitely. So, I relocated to the U.S. I sold a company uh, in Israel and relocated to the U.S. Yeah. And to my surprise, I just couldn't get a credit card. Uh, as did my co-founders. Uh, but you had point, the money. You had the money to spend. That was not the issue, right? Definitely. So, so, so who are you servicing more specifically? What kind of clients do you deal with? So every year, hundreds of thousands of professionals relocate to the U.S. to work for companies like Google, LinkedIn, McKinsey, Goldman. Right. Um, and by and large, these are our target group. We, we target these people. We give them a high-quality credit card on day mm -hmm. one, basically eliminate uh, eliminating a lot of the pain that they feel as they move to the U.S. so that they can focus on actually building their new life in the country instead of chasing a new credit card. Right. And, and I mean, again, credit has a lot to do with being able to rent apartments. There, there's, a, there's a lot that having a credit card in the United States has tied into your daily life. So for those of our viewers who are interested in learning more about the service, how can they access it? Well, we actually have a very simple application process on our website at uh, creditstacks.com and uh, they're very welcome to go online and apply and uh, we'd be delighted to accept them as customers if they qualify. Beautiful. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Very Thanks interesting uh, solution you have here. Thank you. All right. Last week, we introduced you to the Israel skeleton, who's about to rep the Jewish state in the Winter Olympics most dangerous event. Well, now the entire Israeli Olympic delegation is heading to South Korea to compete for the gold at the 2018 Pyeongchang Games. And guess what? This is the largest turnout of Israeli athletes in any Winter Olympic Games. 
All right, I don't want to burst anyone's bubble, but so far Israel has actually never won even a single medal in the Winter Olympics. But here's the good news that may be about to change. This year, the Jewish state sending eight skaters, an alpine skier, and our favorite skeleton racer to compete for Olympic glory. Israeli figure skater Alexei Baichenko is hoping to redeem himself after failing to win a medal in the 2014 Winter Games in Sochi, Russia. Hopes are high that he might do just that because this year he's returning to the Games as the silver medalist in the 2016 European Figure Skating Championships. And by the way, he's got one sick quadruple jump. Now, it won't only be Israeli athletes turning heads in South Korea, though. This year's Games will also feature Israeli tech, a special viewing feature that will allow instant replays in cutting edge, edge 3D. I think we can all say that this is gold medal worthy. For anyone wondering where Gal Gadot's star might possibly rise next, well, Israel's very own Hollywood mega-celeb has just tweeted the answer herself. Gadot is proud to announce that she's all set to appear as a character on the longest-running animated series of all time, The Simpsons. Homer, Marge, Bart, Lisa, and yes, little baby Maggie are about to come face to face with possibly the biggest star of the year, Gal Gadot. Well, an animated version of her anyhow. But as Gadot has excitedly mentioned, she will be voicing her own voice. Like so many of us, Gadot grew up on the classic Simpsons cartoon show, and the series is famed for its zany humor and celebrity cameos. Gadot now joins big shots like Tom Hanks, Elizabeth Taylor, Lady Gaga, all who have performed on this show, and even Borat funny man Sasha Baron Cohen, who played an Israeli tour guide when The Simpsons went to the Holy Land. Well, we will be more than excited to tune in for this one. All right, guys, everyone's favorite TV scientist, Bill Nye, the science guy, is literally on a science high. His new Netflix series, Bill Nye Saves the World, has just premiered its latest season, offering an exclusive look at how Israel is leading and healing the world with medical marijuana. So consider the following. The series two premiere dubbed the Marijuana episode takes viewers inside the history and science of medical marijuana. But it's the special segment called How is Israel Healing the World with Marijuana that really takes the special cake. Filmed here in Israel, the episode explores the country's amazing research and innovations in medical cannabis, spearheaded by Tikkun Olam, which is one of the world's top companies in the field. Tikkun Olam actually boasts one of the largest cannabis treatment databases on Earth, and through global cooperations has even created totally new marijuana strains. From there, Israeli scientists have been able to test, monitor, and create all kinds of breakthrough uses for the plant, ranging from cancer medicine to therapies to Alzheimer's treatments. But how is all of this possible? Well, as our Way Cool scientist points out, much is owed to the fact that the Israeli government officially designated cannabis plants to the farming sector last year, which opened the floodgates for proper training, government grants, irrigation, and freedom to study and research cannabis in labs. Israel is one of only three countries in the world that offers government-sponsored cannabis programs. So talk about a nifty home experiment. There's nothing worse than getting into your warm bed and then realizing you have to get back up to turn off the lights. Those are the moments when you wish you could just command your home to do what you want. Well, it turns out these smart homes of the future have actually become a reality. And joining us now with more is Yaron Mizrahi, the CEO of the company Homey Smart. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you to invite me. All right, so I already see that you have a little control unit over there, and I'm, yeah. I'm going to ask you about that. But what is a smart, a smart home, and why would you say it's necessary? Break this down for us. Okay, uh, so smart home has a lot of uh, reasons, uh, but uh, I, th I think we will pick up the main two key reasons, which is uh, control and saving. When we talking about smart home, we want to, to control our homes outside. We are very busy. We are not uh, have enough time with our family, and we still want to be there. So we are able to uh, control smart home when we are outside. And when, and when you say smart home, you're talking about lights, uh, security, I mean, just different electric systems within the house that you can control with your cell phone usually yeah. or a tablet or? Yeah, actually, our company was focusing on uh, smart electricity because we think this is the base of the smart home. Yeah. If you have uh, smart electricity, then you can get all other gadgets right. inside and you can have the sensors and such things. Uh, we built a powerful uh, uh, electricity, which you don't need really to think what kind of device I'm going to plug in. 
it right. will operate any any way. Very interesting. So, yeah. I also understand that you have a voice command system, right? Yeah, Let's take yeah. a look at that. We have a little video. Hi, I'm Homey Smart, the assistant for your smart home. What would you like to do? Turn on scenario morning. Turn on scenario morning. Set successfully. Something else? Turn off scenario morning. Turn off scenario morning. Set successfully. Something else? No. no. So what, when you're talking about turn, you know these settings, these are pre settings that exist, so a person can. Yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, we can see here the smart socket and switch that we had uh, developed. We become a Google partner for the Google Assistant. Nowadays, we don't need to touch our tablets or iPhones or uh, computers to operate our smart home. All we need to do is just talk. Yeah. We talk with the system and it just operates great. Wow, that's amazing. Okay, I mean, this could, like I said, it could be very useful if you're, <laughs> if you climb into bed and you don't want to get and turn the lights off. Now, um, this this service or, or this these series of products that you have, um, do they apply to private homes, to buildings, to office buildings? Uh, Actually, we we uh, we got the understanding that uh, home users are so much different than business uh -huh. uh, and offices. So we have different divisions for. For the home users, we provide whatever smart home provides. But for the offices, we also have a special uh, platform that helps them to uh, manage users, to see all the usage uh, of the electricity in terms of money, not only in right, terms of... Right, because there are some environmental yeah. benefits and financial benefits to yeah. having uh, th these types of um, systems implemented, right? All right, well, thank you for joining us yeah. so much and telling us about this. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> This is so heartbreaking, but every year over a quarter of a million kids are diagnosed with cancer, which includes hundreds of children living right here in Israel. Well, one group of Israeli volunteers are taking a very unique approach to kicking cancer in the butt, almost literally. They're teaching young patients how to deal with their illness through martial arts. Check this out. The anger, the frustration, the pain, those feelings of helplessness and more all take a physical and mental toll on cancer patients. And when you're a kid dealing with all that, well, I can't even imagine. But that's where kids kicking cancer enters the equation. אז אנחנו לא רק עוסקים במכות ובעיטות, אלא אנחנו עוסקים בנשימות ובדמיון מוטרח, שהם כלים שאפשר להשתמש בהם בכל מיני מצבים קשים בחיים. And it works. This incredible program was originally started by U.S.-based Rabbi Ali Melech Goldberg, who lost his two-year-old daughter to leukemia. Now it's up and running in 20 cities all over the world. Israel's two-time world karate silver medalist Denny Hakim runs the local chapter here in the Holy Land. And it brings together black belt volunteers, regardless of race, religion, or politics, to help fight the number one enemy of all. The program teaches kids focus, meditation, inner strength, and healthy ways to expel their inner anguish. So look out, cancer, you're about to get a butt whooping. And now it's time for our Hebrew word of the day. Israeli kids are learning to fight their cancer by mastering their own inner concentration through martial arts. So in honor of that, today we're talking about how to focus or concentrate or in Hebrew, litrakez. Well, if you want to be a black belt, a pilot, or even a jetty, you must be able to litrakez, or to concentrate. Yes, when I mitrakezet, or focus, I can definitely solve all kinds of problems. I mean, meditation is basically just a way to litrakez, right? I say carve out just a little bit of time to litrakez all to yourself just once a day, because a little bit of likuz, or concentration, goes a long way. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at the weather forecast. Temperatures are expected to continue to rise tonight and tomorrow as the winter heat wave continues strong. Tonight should have a low of 53 or 12 degrees Celsius, while tomorrow's high will remain an unseasonably hot 77 or 25 degrees Celsius. All right, that's it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.47 shekels to the American dollar. Remember to sign up for our daily newsletter at ILTV.tv. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook at Israel English News and on Twitter at ILTV News. I'm Natasha Kirchuk, and thanks for watching.